Will you open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14? So yesterday we reflected on the life of Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, and at the end of Isaiah chapter 14, we see a very specific prophecy against the Philistines who are rejoicing in the death of Ahaz, and a warning is going to come to them. So Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 28, we read, In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. So in the year that Ahaz dies, the, uh, the, the, the Philistine people are given this warning. Because the rod of him that smote thee, well, that was Ahaz when he was trying to, to fight against the Philistines, is broken. For out of the serpent's root, Ahaz is the serpent. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. So, so the, the Philistines are told, you're laughing because Ahaz is dead. Well, believe you me, you've got nothing to laugh about because out of the root, the serpent's root, is going to become the fiery flying serpent, which is going to be Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is going to bring blessings. And the firstborn of the poor, verse 30, shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill the root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestinia art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. So from the north, we know that the great superpower that is going to come sweeping down, that will also come into the Philistine territory, is the Assyrians. So if we're making some notes in our margin from the north, we're looking at that smoke, that's the Assyrians. The fiery flying serpent is Hezekiah, and, and the serpent's root, well, that is Ahaz. What shall one then answer, the messengers of the nation? That Yahweh has founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. Now, what is the defining characteristic of Hezekiah? He is the man who puts his trust in God. And so Zion, we're going to see in our studies in the next few days, is going to become the refuge of the poor of the people that they might take trust in Zion. Now come with me to the king's record, to 2 Kings chapter 18, where we're introduced to Hezekiah in the record of the kings. Verse 1, it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty-nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And we're going to pause for a second. How is it possible that a man such as Hezekiah can have a father such as Ahaz? Now, quite clearly, God looked after Hezekiah. But we want to note that the record in Chronicles and in Kings makes clear to us who his mother is. And the point is this, mums, mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, you make the difference. In our home, when I grew up, it was my mum that organized the home, right? She made sure that there was a meal on the table and then as soon as the clearing up was done, we did the readings as a family. 
every single night. In my house now, the reality is, if it was left to me, the readings wouldn't happen as effectively as they do. What would happen is that I'd come in and then we'd have a meal and then I'd say, oh, you know, I've got to prepare for a Bible school. And my children would be let down. But in our house, my wife makes certain that when we've had our meal, the readings happen. And I'm expected to con contribute. I'm expected to lead those readings. And so never ever think as a woman within the brotherhood that your role is some lesser role. It is the highest of callings to ensure that each household is running properly. Take it so seriously. Grandparents, each week, my mum and dad come to our house for a meal. And they come before I get in from work and they do a Christadelphian Isolation League lesson with our three youngest children. They did it with Lily when she was younger and they did it with her cousins when they were younger. And they sit down and they use the CIL lessons because it, 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 part of the work is done for you in preparation. And they give the children a Sunday school lesson. Then we have food together. Then we do the readings. My kids know there's nothing that their granny wants more than for them to be in the kingdom. And so we've got to make wise decisions in family lives to put first, to seek first the kingdom of God. Mums, grandmothers, you are central to that role as Abby was to her son, Hezekiah. And so no wonder, despite his father, when he comes to the throne, what does he do? Verse 4, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the graves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan, or it was called Nehushtan. Now just have a look at the slide there, because you'll see that in the Hebrew, and I don't speak any Hebrew at all, but when we look at the Strong's numbers, we're, we're greatly helped. The, the word brazen, the word serpent, the word nehushtan, well, they're all from the same root Hebrew word. If you look at the Strong's numbers, that gives us our clues. Can you see that brazen is Strong's number H5178? Serpent is 5175. Nehushtan is 5180. Can you see that they're all clustered together? They're all about the idea of a brass serpent. And what Hezekiah does is break in pieces the thinking of the flesh. So what you see in verse 4 is Hezekiah comes to the throne. This man is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and he smashes, he breaks in pieces the things of the flesh. The, the, the things that he's inherited from his father, he's going to break up. We notice too, in verse 8, he smote the Philistines even unto Gaza. Well, that is the fulfillment of Isaiah 14. In the year that King Ahaz died, as the Philistines are laughing away, ha ha, you know, Hezekiah is going to be a softy. No, no, no. This is the fiery flying serpent. You see in verse 8, you might put a note next to there of Isaiah 14. It's actually already in my margin, Isaiah 14. And I can't read my margin without my glasses on. Isaiah 14, verse 29, or something like that. All right? You might need to look it up. Now, as soon as we see a phrase like break in pieces, we're interested. It's the Hebrew word put on the screen there, which I can't pronounce, something like kathath, and it means to bruise or to violently strike. So when he breaks in pieces the brazen serpent, the, the Hebrew word tells us he, it's to bruise or to violently strike, breaking in pieces. And, and we have that particular word used in Deuteronomy chapter 9. We won't turn there because of time, but you might like to make a note 
Deuteronomy 9, verse 21, where Moses, when reflecting on the incident with the golden calf, says, I took your sin, the calf which you'd made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it. And that's what Hezekiah is doing here. He's stamping out the brazen serpent. We're reminded too, when we look at that word and we're told in the Hebrew that it means to bruise, of what the work of the Lord Jesus Christ was. The promised seed who would bruise the head of the serpent. Genesis 3, 15. We're, we're being shown in the king's record, verse one, as it were, as Hezekiah comes onto the scene, this man is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in verse five, we read, he trusted in Yahweh, God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Now, just to put that graphic on the screen, which isn't particularly clear, but you can see that, that, that the word trusted, it's not used that many occasions in Scripture. But in 2 Kings, the word is used nine times exclusively of Hezekiah. So when it says that Hezekiah trusted in Yahweh more, well, it's absolutely abundantly clear on the record because the only king in the second king's record that saw, it speaks about trusting in God is Hezekiah. We see it used just once in the Chronicles record and then in Isaiah, it's used on many occasions of Hezekiah. And we could look elsewhere in Isaiah and in the Psalms, but, but just to, to make that point really clear, this man really does trust in God. And how is it? What is it he does? Verse 6. For he clave to Yahweh and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which Yahweh commanded Moses. And Yahweh was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. Do you see the contrast? What did Ahaz say to the king of Assyria? He said to Tiglath-Pileser, I am your servant. Hezekiah, no, no, I am not your servant. I will not serve King Sin. I'm going to break in pieces the thinking of the serpent. I'm going to put my trust in God. And he does it by cleaving to Yahweh and departing not from following him. We see that word in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Let's just, just quickly flick across to Deuteronomy 13. It's good for us to uh, turn up a reference, isn't it, every now and again. It keeps us wide awake. So Deuteronomy 13, Moses, in speaking to the people, he tells them that what they need to do is there to maintain a relationship with God when they go into the land. You shall, verse 4 of Deuteronomy 13, you shall walk after Yahweh your God, fear him, keep his commandments, obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave to him. And so, brothers and sisters, if we are to ensure that we cleave to God, and the word cleave, you know, is the word used in Genesis chapter 2 regarding Adam and Eve, that a man should cleave unto his wife, and they should be one flesh. We ask ourselves, is our relationship with our Heavenly Father as strong as the relationship we have with our husband or our wife? It ought to be at least that strong and, of course, stronger. He is the one we should cleave to. And Hezekiah, that's what he did. He tied himself to God in following his ways. And, of course, God made him to prosper. He did it by walking after the Lord his God, by fear him, keeping his commandments, obeying his voice, serving him. That's how we cleave to God. 
We don't cleave to God by simply saying, yep, yep, yeah, I, I, I've got a really good relationship with, with, with God, yep. I can come before God in prayer and I've, you know, I, I really can trust in God. Are we walking in his ways, fearing him, keeping his commandments, obeying his voice, serving him? That's how we cleave to God. That's how Hezekiah developed that relationship with God. Come with me now to the Chronicles record, to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. where we read that Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old. He reigned 20 and nine years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Abiah. Now we saw in the King's record that it was Abi, but here we're told the full name of Hezekiah's mother. And it's interesting because as a brother came and spoke to me yesterday, Ahaz also had a full name. Ahaz's full name, although he's always referred to as Ahaz on the record, we actually know his name was Jeho Ahaz. But how could a man who put no trust in Yahweh be referred to on the record as Jehu Ahaz. We'll come to Ahaz's name and what it means a little later on. Abi means father. She played the role of both mother and father. And sometimes relationships can go horribly wrong for all sorts of reasons. And a mother may well have to play the role of both mother and father. Take inspiration from Abi. But she made sure that Abi Yah, that Yahweh was the father of Hezekiah. That's what we've got to do to our children. Their heavenly father is the most important relationship in their lives, in any of our lives. Our children, we've got to develop, to grow up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, knowing that their father, who they can always rely on, who's never away with work, who's never away at a Bible school, their father they can always rely on is their heavenly father. No doubt, that's what Hezekiah's mother taught him. And so now as he comes to the throne, he did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh according to all that David his father had done. He took so much inspiration from David. He in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of Yahweh and repaired them. What did Ahaz do? Go back to the previous chapter, verse 24. He shut up the doors of the house of Yahweh. And so Hezekiah is now enacting these major reforms. He's turning back the mess that his father had put the nation into. And he's resetting the vision. He pulls together the Levites and he says in verse 6, Our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of Yahweh and turned their backs also, they've shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. And so what's he doing? He's pulling the Levites, who so often are the group who are prepared to say, we'll stand on the Lord's side. We'll stand on Yahweh's side. And they're the first group amongst the reform to say, we're with you, Hezekiah. And they stand with him. And, and what Hezekiah does is he stands in front of them and resets the vision. You remember in verse 19 of chapter 28, Ahaz, king of Israel, he made Judah naked. What did Proverbs 29, 18 say? Where there is no vision, the people are made naked. He's resetting the vision. That's what he's doing in verse 6 and 7 to the Levites that they might be inspired to get serving, to get to work. And now, brothers and sisters, 
I want you to get to work. And I'm going to put a table in front of you here that you're going to have five minutes in which I'm not going to talk. And you're going to have a chat with the people on your table, and you're going to see if you can fill in the blanks for you to see the reforms that Hezekiah is making, that Hezekiah is turning the work of his father upside down. So I've made it easy for you. There are references down the sides, but you need to work to fill in the blanks, and you've got five minutes. Off you go. All right, well, I think we've had enough time now. Has everyone finished? So, no? Well, fear not. An answer sheet's going on the, on the, on the uh, screen. Um, and y you can see that we, we made yesterday, we sort of touched, didn't we, on suggesting that, that Hezekiah could well have been that son to pass through the fire. Uh, the, the Isaiah record picks up of the servant, who we know is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first instance. That is the nation, and it's also Hezekiah. His visage was so marred more than any man. We saw the contrast between who are you going to serve? Hezekiah comes to the throne. I will not serve the king of Assyria. That's got to be our mindset. We, we saw in 2 Kings 16 that Uriah built the Syrian altar. The contrast in 2 Chronicles 29, when Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. He reinstates, doesn't he, the brazen altar. In 2 Chronicles 28, that Ahaz made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. What you see emphasized in 2 Chronicles 29, on I, I've colored them in from verse 18 down to, to verse 27, the altar, the altar, the altar, the altar. Time and again, we're told about the true altar that Hezekiah reinstates. The next one was a little bit more cryptic. Ahaz took down the sea from off the brazen oxen. What do the oxen represent? Service. So well done. It wasn't cryptic at all. Um, you got it all very easily. So 2 Chronicles 29 verse 11, Hezekiah calls the Levites to stand before Yahweh to serve him. 2 Chronicles 28 verse 24, Ahaz we saw cut in pieces the vessels. What do the vessels represent in scripture? What do the vessels represent in scripture? The people. What does Hezekiah do? Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified. Second Chronicles 28 verse 24, he shut up the doors and Hezekiah opens the doors. What an extraordinary reformation. Now come with me to Second Chronicles 29 and verse 4. Let's start to pick out some of the details here. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. So can you picture the temple? It's there on the screen in front of you. The east street is just to the right-hand side of the steps that we can see there. You remember that the temple is there facing east. The brazen altar, you remember, was put up onto the north. So Levi, the, the, the Hezekiah gathers the, the, the Levites and those priests that are, that are ready and are faithful enough on the east street, and it's the, the broad way outside there. And you can picture him, you've got to try to picture him. He stood up on those steps. He's the king in the first year, in the first month of his reign, and he's going to give them the message. He said, hear me, verse 5, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of Yahweh God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So what do we see? Just turn the page if you need to in verse 15, that they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of Yahweh to cleanse the house of Yahweh. And brothers and sisters, in the actions of Hezekiah here, we see one just like the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that the Levites were given in the same way that the disciples were given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Will, will you keep a marker here? We're coming straight back, but come with me to John 17. The Gospel of John chapter 17. 
And you remember that John chapter 17 is the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in his last week. And his prayer is particularly about his disciples. And he prays, we read in John 17 and verse 17, sanctify them. He's speaking of his disciples. The the disciples are those, if you look through John 17, you'll see repeatedly, they are those that were given to the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the Levites were given. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And as for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And so, brothers and sisters, if we begin to begin the work in ecclesial life, don't ever kid ourselves that what God wants from us is to to show that our works are so wonderful, we're so good at charitable things, that all of our neighbours look around at us and say, well, have you seen the Owen household? Do you know what they do? Every day they go and wash all the neighbours' cars. They must be the most Christian household on the block, right? Actually, what they normally hear is me shouting, saying, get in the car, it's Sunday morning. We mustn't ever, ever fool ourselves as a brotherhood. That our job is to be called to do some great charitable acts. That the world might look at us and say, there's something else, those Christadelphians. Of course, of course, we try to copy the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. But we don't do it. On show, we try to do those things quietly. We don't want the praise of men. We want to be in the kingdom of God. And so the only basis for the works that we do is based on the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The word of God is our guide. That's what we preach. That's what we put our energy and our effort into as a brotherhood. Into telling people about the truth, about God's word. I want you to keep a marker here because I'm going to get you to flick back here in just a second, but I want you to come back to the Chronicles record. I always think, what a blessing it is that we've got so many fingers, right? So useful, isn't it, for for shoving them in our Bible. So here we are. You've got one in John 17, but you're going to come back with me to 2 Chronicles 29. So they're cleansed, they're sanctified. We know that they've got to reinstate the labors that have been uh, so um, disrespected by Ahaz. And they do so, and and the priest, and we now read verse 16, went into the inner part of the house of Yahweh to cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness they'd found in the temple of Yahweh, into the court of the house of Yahweh. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. Now we're seeing something really special happening here. Because these disciples, as it were, these Levites, under the leadership of Hezekiah, as it were, the one like the Lord Jesus Christ. What do they do with the rubbish that they find in the inner part of the house of Yahweh? They took it and carried it out abroad to the brook Kidron. Now, are you still got that finger in John 17? Go now to the end of John 17, And keep going into John 18 and verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he'd finished that prayer, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron. And it's at this brook, as he crosses the brook and comes into the garden, 
the Garden of Gethsemane, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have the greatest internal struggle of his life. If he can get through the garden, as it were, then the Lord Jesus Christ is so strong spiritually and mentally, he's going to be able to deal with the agony of the suffering that's going to be brought upon him by the authorities. It's more awful than it bears thinking about. And the gospel records kindly spare us of the terribleness of the detail. But I believe that it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that the internal battle of the Lord Jesus Christ in dealing with the problem of sin was to be dealt with as he crossed the brook Kidron. And brothers and sisters, that's our greatest battle. We speak of the challenge of the world. We speak of the challenge of the Assyrian bearing down, looming large on our lives. But we should have no doubt that the greatest struggle is the inner man's struggle. And so did you notice in verse 16, the priests went into the inner part of the house of Yahweh. They've got to get right into the inner workings of the mind to clear it out of the rubbish and to get it across the brook Kedron. Brothers and sisters, that challenge is just the same for all of us. We've got to get into the inner part of our minds. No one knows the inner part of your mind, save the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you. And so you've got to take that battle on. I've got to take that battle on. It's easy to stand here and to, to, to look like we're doing the right things. What's the inner mind like? That's the one that we've got to train and get the rubbish out of. A helpful rec reference is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Keep a marker, of course, but come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we'd like to go in at verse 16. What agreement had the temple of God with idols? You see the work that the Levites are doing in the temple. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. That's what the Levites did originally, wasn't it? That's how they became the special tribe, because they came out from among them and they were prepared to be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's what we've got to try to do. Be prepared to, to come out, to be separate. It's not fashionable anymore to be separate. So often we see children, young people, and their parents caught up with the things of school life and, 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 and beyond in clubs and, and social things that have got nothing to do with the ecclesia. If we do that as families, we're giving our children all the wrong messages about being separate from the world. We've got to come out from among them, be separate as the Levites were, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Just quickly come to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, we pick up this idea again, where we read in verse 
14, regarding the blessings that we Gentiles are part of the covenant promises. For this cause, because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bow my knees, Ephesians 3 verse 14, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family, Jew and Gentile in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. What a blessing is ours to know the gospel message, to have the truth. We should be strengthened by it in the inner man. Come with me back to the record in Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles chapter 29. We see something remarkable in terms of the timing. Verse 17. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of Yahweh. So they sanctified the house of Yahweh in eight days. And on the 16th day of the first month, they made an end. Now this is amazing. <clears throat> because we see that there's, there's two lots of eight days here. The first eight days, they get to the porch. There was so much mess. It took a week and a day to get it sorted out. And then another eight days when inside the house including getting into the inner part of the house and cleansing that. So that at the end of 16 days, they'd done it. They'd done the work. How long did Ahaz reign for? 16 years. Now, isn't that lovely? That what our Heavenly Father can do, who strengthens us, is allow us if we are cleansed by his word in the work, to work 365 times faster if he is at our back. I think that's lovely. 16 days, 16 years. Now Ahaz, his name means one that grasps. He was named by his father, Jehoahaz, because his father wanted him to grasp at Yahweh. But the divine record does not call him Jehoahaz. He's called Ahaz, one that grasps. And I think there's just a little interesting play here that we see in Philippians chapter 2. So again, keep your marker, but come with me to Philippians chapter 2. And it's the English Standard Version that helps us with this particular translation of the Greek Scripture. In Philippians chapter 2, we read about the servant who is the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall see in our final study how much of this relates to Hezekiah. But of course, it's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Philippians chapter 2, we read, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to read now from the ESV, which I put on the screen there. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Ahaz, well... Instead of wanting to grasp at God, he, he wanted to be like a God. The Lord Jesus Christ and Hezekiah too did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. That's what Hezekiah does. That's why in the servant prophecies of Isaiah, we see Hezekiah first. He took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. So we just see that tiny little snippet when we look at the name of Ahaz and we look at Philippians chapter 2. I want us to come back to 2 Chronicles 29. We have nine minutes and we're going to 
bring our thoughts together. So, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 18. Then they went in to Hezekiah. So, so the priests, and the Levites particularly, they've done the work, they've cleansed the temple. And they go into Hezekiah the king and said, we've cleansed all the house of Yahweh and the altar of burnt offering. Now, number one, remember what Ahaz did. So the first thing they tell Hezekiah is, we, we, we've done the work, we've sorted the altar. We've got rid of that Syrian monstrosity and we've put the brazen altar back in its rightful place. That's the first thing we've done. We've cleansed the house of Yahweh and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof. Well, the people needed to be sanctified, didn't they? So the vessels representing the people are sanctified. And the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. And we just ask ourselves the question, well, it's easy to see why the Levites come bursting in to Hezekiah and tell him that they've done the work, they've cleaned the place up. In 16 days, Hezekiah would have been delighted with them. It's easy for us to understand why the first thing they tell him is, we've got the altar back in its rightful place. Oh, terrific, good news, well done. And the vessels, well, that's super news. Because, of course, what Ahaz did, 2 Chronicles 28, verse 24, is cut in pieces the vessels of the house of the Lord. Super. But we're not told about any of the other instruments of the temple. Save, and we ask the question, why? The table of showbread. Now, I'm going to suggest to you it's central to what Hezekiah is going to do next. Just flick across to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, we read a little detail about the table of showbread. So we just want this one verse. Verse 5, thou shalt take fine flour, Leviticus 24, verse 5, and bake 12 cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake, and thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row upon the pure table before the Lord. There are 12 cakes, 12 pieces of bread on the table of showbread. Why 12? Well, of course, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Hezekiah, you can come with me back to Chronicles now. Hezekiah, well, he's not the king of the 12 tribes of Israel. He's the king in Judah. But this king is a special king. Because what he's going to do is try to unite all of the tribes. And so we're going to see in our study tomorrow, 2 Chronicles verse 30, verse, 2 Chronicles 30, apologies, verse 1, Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah. What Hezekiah is going to do is try to unite the 12 tribes. He's going to try to bring them back to true worship in Jerusalem. And so we suggest that the table of showbread, which speaks to us, of course, as the table, the memorial table speaks to us each week of the fellowship that we have together through the bread. The 12 loaves on the table of showbread symbolize that what Hezekiah is going to want to do is bring together Judah and Israel, the 12 tribes all together. We've spoken enough, I think, of the vessels. You just see in verse 18 and 19, there's this emphasis on the vessels three times. We know, you've told me already, the vessels represent people. 2 Timothy 2 verse 21 is a reference to put in the margin next to verse 18 and 19. 
2 Timothy 2, 21. If a man therefore purge himself, he will be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared to every good work. And so what happens now? Verse 20. Hezekiah the king rose early. This is a type of the Lord Jesus. And gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of Yahweh. Now he gathers, you notice, the rulers of the city. And did you also notice that when the priests and Levites had finished the work of cleansing the temple, they didn't turn to Hezekiah, who was with them in the cleansing work. They had to go to him in the palace, presumably. He actually wasn't with them. He'd, he'd led them. He'd set the vision. He'd told them exactly what needed to happen. And so what's Hezekiah been doing for 16 days? Has he put his feet up in the palace, pleased that he's the king? No. He's been doing something very, very special. Keep a marker and come to Proverbs 25. We're going to close our thoughts here. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. These also are, these are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Hezekiah has not had his feet up for 16 days. He has pulled, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 20, he gathered the rulers of the city. And he's got these rulers, and he said to them, if you are to be rulers with me as king, we've got to get back to basics. Well, you know, okay, well, what is it you need us to do? Go and get a pen and paper. What, well, what, what do you want us to do? you're to start copying out the Proverbs of King Solomon. We need wisdom. We need godly wisdom as rulers. We need the word of God to be at the heart of what we do in ruling this city. And so these men have been writing down the Proverbs. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter. The heaven for height, the earth for depth. Can anyone remember yesterday when Ahaz was asked for, by Isaiah, would you like a sign? He refused the sign, didn't he? Let me just read to you Isaiah 7. Moreover, Yahweh spake again to Ahaz saying, verse 11 of Isaiah 7, Ask the sign of the Lord thy God, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Proverbs 25, verse 3. The heaven for height, the earth for depth. The heart of kings is unsearchable. The sign that Hezekiah wants the men to have is the word of God. Copy it out. The heaven for height, the earth for depth. Get this down. Take away the dross. From the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. We've seen the vessels now meet for the master's use. They're ready to work. Take away the wicked from before the king. They have to do that. And no doubt some of the rulers, they said, oh, no, Hezekiah, you know, no, we, I'm not writing this out. Get them out. If the word of God is not going to be the priority of your life, get out. There's got to be this refining process. Put not forth yourself in the presence of king and stand not in the place of great men. For it's better that it be said unto thee, come up hither. Thou shalt be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. And so what Hezekiah now does is 2 Chronicles 29 verse 20. He went up. He invites them up to the house of the Lord. And so, brothers and sisters, 
we just close by reminding ourselves that we've got to be sanctified by the Word of God. It's got to be the priority of your life, of you personally, of your family, of your ecclesia. We've got to allow it to cleanse us, to, to wash the mind in order to get into the inner mind and to get rid of the filth and the rubbish that so easily fills it. We can be reminded that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He stamped out sin for us. We just have to follow him as the men did with Hezekiah. And if we're prepared to do that, then we too can be vessels for honor, meat for the master's use.